Michael Gelb, welcome back to the Plant Yourself podcast. Always fabulous to be with you. Thanks. Yeah, so we've been um, talking quite a bit. We're part of a, uh, a, a weekly group getting together to talk about all sorts of stuff. And like one day we're on video, you were like swaying back and forth a little bit and moving your hands. <laughs> <laughs> like, is that Qigong? And from that question, I'm now taking a course that you recommended from one of the, the great Qigong masters in the world, and I'm on week three and loving it. And I don't know anything about it, except like the ways I'm, the ways I'm sort of breathing and moving my hands now. And I just I wanted to share this with with my audience because it's already, you know, I'm seeing growth and change in myself in terms of health, in terms of equanimity. And so, um, you know, you've been teaching for many years, you've been organizing conferences, you've studied with with everybody. And so, you know, the 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 best and the rest. And so maybe just begin by sharing like your journey to um, to understanding and practicing and appreciating um, Qi, Qigong and all, all of the energetic systems that are aligned with it. Sure. Well, the first thing to say is that Qi isn't mysterious. It's something we're all familiar with. It just happens to be the Chinese word for life force. It's also chi in or ki in Japan. It's prana or shakti in India. And it's mojo or the force in the West. <laughs> and it's what makes life beautiful. It's my breakfast the other day when I was out on my patio and just marveling at the dew on the blades of grass in the morning sunlight. It's so enlivening, it's so beautiful. But it's the same thing, it's when you go, one of my favorite simple examples is you go to the fish market. This is really down to earth. You go to the fish market, you don't pick out the fish that sort of looks brown and tired. And <laughs> no, you look for the fish that looks like it's still alive, that it's still swimming, that it's, it's glowing. Or the uh, you go to the vegetable market and you're looking <laughs> yeah. oh, for now, the, now my folks understand. What is the most, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. What's the fish? We don't eat that. Whatever. <laughs> uh, uh, the broccoli. <laughs> <laughs> the every, every, everybody, now, everybody listening has seen their sad broccoli from the back of the fridge. Oh, right. And, and you want to try to revive it. And maybe if you become <laughs> enough of a Qigong master, I can teach you the advanced broccoli revival method. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, that it's, just, it that's is, definitely going in the sales letter for, you know, no, go, yeah. never throw out leftovers oh. again. Oh, grasshoppers, <laughs> never throw out. <laughs> right, we will get your asparagus to, yeah. <laughs> to re-engorge. <laughs> yeah. That you can really use. Yeah. So, but it, it, it or, or just take music. Uh, what makes music really great? What, what makes one of my favorite pieces of music of all time is Mozart's, well, pretty much anything by Mozart. But if you listen to his uh, Marriage of Figaro and the way that begins, it's, they use that, they, they use that at the opening to Eddie Murphy's movie with Dan Aykroyd, Trading Places. So is this so this just so what you put in people's are. heads? That's the Got it. Okay. So first of all, we know it's genius because I didn't I I just refer to it. You know it and you feel the enlivenment just from remembering it. Yep, absolutely. And and why and this is Mozart 
hundreds of years ago, and it's it's in the opening of a comedy movie from whatever it's 20 or 30 years ago, Trading Places. Why is it at the beginning of Eddie Murphy's movie? Because you go into the movie theater, you click it on your device to watch it now, and it, it just enlivens you and gets you ready to have fun and enjoy this really cool movie because mm -hmm. it's filled with chi. So the broccoli you want to choose, the music you want to listen to, the art, the painting. I mean, what made, one of my favorite paintings is Starry Night by Van Gogh. What makes that painting so amazing? It's somehow imbued with chi. It's imbued with life force. It's part of, it's what make, makes art great. What's visual art, music, it's the force of life. So it's all around us. And the question then is, how do we best cultivate it within us so that we can experience more aliveness mm -hmm. every day? And obviously that becomes more important as we get older. Mm -hmm. So these traditions go back for thousands of years. And, and by the way, let's also be clear that every indigenous tradition has some kind of practice like this. Mm. Uh, yoga is the one we know of the most coming uh, to us through India. And yoga is phenomenal. I've been studying yoga for many, many years. And it, it has the same purpose, which is to cultivate the flow of the life force and experience our oneness with all of nature and the disappearance of our separate, the illusion of a separate ego so that we experience bliss and enlightenment. It's just the Chinese have systematically simplified all of this to what I have found to be the, the simplest and easy, what easiest way of all the methodologies that I've studied to access and cultivate that, mm. that life, that life energy. Mm. So I guess when I said it was mysterious, I'm thinking as a materialist, right? Which is the tradition I come out of, you know, Western science that, that doesn't really look at anything that's not physical or tangible or obeys laws of nature. So when we were talking, you mentioned you told some stories about some of the Qigong masters that you have known who can do things that, um, you know, according to my understanding of physics are impossible. Well, that's actually just a, a limited understanding of physics. Sorry, I know you went to print. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I wasn't smart enough to get to take physics at Princeton. I, I, I'm, talking, I'm talking 10th grade. Okay. <laughs> so uh, let's not, we won't uh, uh, go off on a whole tangent about, about phys physics or the. Uh, no, but just like, well, you know, Western medicine has not embraced the idea of energy, right? So well, this, the, uh, the, the, the Harvard uh, Women's Health Newsletter, this many years ago already said, uh, in reference to Tai Chi and, and Qigong, they basically described it as it's not just meditation in motion, it's medication in motion. Hmm. So there are a lot of very well researched health benefits to these practices. And you need to explain, you don't, one of my favorite sayings is from the social critic, Fran Leibowitz, who says, I don't believe in anything you have to believe in. <laughs> right? so, so I don't believe in this. This is not my religion. This is not a faith. I want to feel better. I want to have more and more energy as I get older. I want to recover from injuries 
I want to have more power as a martial artist. So these are all very measurable, practical phenomena. And the main, you know, the real main reason I do, I mean, I've written a book about it. I teach seminars. I can talk about, we could talk about the physics. We could talk about all the research. The main reason I do this is it feels great every day. Mm -hmm. I like to feel better. And I've done, you know, yoga and meditation and the Alexander Technique and Rolfing and Feldenkrais, uh, you name it, I've, I've done it and I've done it with masters just for the last 45 years. My, my master's degree is in psychophysical re-education. So I've always studied body, mind practices and what do I actually do every day? What are the ones that I practice every day? Well, among them, Qigong, Tai Chi, the Alexander Technique, walking in nature. These are the most potent practices I found in a lifetime of exploring what really works, what, what gives me more energy. Great. So how, how did you come across these? Um, you know, when, when you did, I think they were far more esoteric than they are now. Well, everything I mean, was. you're one of the you're one of the reasons that they were more that they're no longer as esoteric. Well, thank you. Well, that's very nice to say. And I've done my best to, to try to spread the gospel of these wonderful practices in. From 1974 to 78. I trained as a teacher of the Alexander Technique, which is a system developed in the West, actually in uh, Tasmania, by a Shakespearean actor who was having trouble with his voice. And he developed a, one of the first Western systems of body-mind transformation and again, he was trying to solve a practical problem. He was losing his voice while doing Shakespeare. And he developed his method and he stopped losing his voice and he became famous on the stage for the power of his stage presence. So people began to come to him for lessons and the Alexander Technique is now taught in the world's great schools of drama and music. They teach it at the Juilliard School, the Royal Academy of Music, many of the most famous performers in the world study the Alexander Technique. So they do that not because they believe in something. They do it because they want to have more stage presence. They want to be more flexible and poised on stage. They want to be able to use their voice in an easier, more effective mm -hmm. manner. So you, um, I know Daniel Day-Lewis is a, a devotee. And so if anyone's seen him in any of his films, what, what, you know, one thing is he's he's a different act, a different human being in every film. It's not like, you know, some actors are just playing themselves. Like he's got tools to totally transform. And when you see him in interviews or just being Daniel Day Lewis, he moves with a grace and presence and power that's almost, you know, Panther like, as opposed to like, you know, the way humans can kind of lumber around. Well, that, that ability is something we can all develop. And that's what the Alexander Technique helps us do. So that was my first real intensive immersion. I mean, I trained as an Alexander Technique teacher. My first book is called Body Learning, an Introduction to the Alexander Technique. And it was only when I began studying the Chinese lineage systems of Qigong that I realized that Alexander effectively figured it out from an entirely different cultural context, trying to solve the problem of performing on stage and using his voice rather than the problem that the Chinese lineage masters were solving, which was how do you become more effective as a martial artist? How do you recover faster when you get injured in combat? And then they, then they realized 
as they made progress in developing these methods to be stronger and more resilient, they realized that there was a component of it that had to do with awareness and consciousness and creativity. So when they weren't fighting or recovering from having been in a fight, they realized that this was the essence of creativity so that they would imbue in poetry or in song or in calligraphy the the chi and that's what made the poetry the song or the calligraphy particularly exquisite mm -hmm. so one of the things that i i've had a lot of fun synthesizing putting together is what are the similarities of the alexander technique and the Chinese lineage systems and Tai Chi, which is a martial art based on Qigong practices. And, and also Aikido, which I've also studied and taught for many, many years. So, so the Qi in Aikido and the Qi in Qigong are the same, refer to the same mm -hmm. life force. So, and it makes sense. If, if something is really true, it must be universal. It's got to be true in Japan and China and Tasmania and New Jersey. Uh, we may have different names for it or different ways of referring to it. But what's cool about what the, the Chinese did is over line, lineages, over generation after generation after generation, clans passed down what they learned and initiated younger members of the clan to to learn this. Mm -hmm. And the truth is, yeah, over centuries, a lot of that stuff got twisted and weird and bizarrely esoteric and strange because there's here's an important thing. There's no correlation whatsoever between power in any inner discipline and good character. Hmm. So power corrupts, whether it's spiritual power or chi power. So the more powerful you become, the more you need checks and balances. <laughs> so I've met many Qigong masters uh, and a reasonable percentage of them are completely <laughs> <laughs> I mean, they might be able to do all these wacky, crazy things, but don't avoid, I wouldn't get too close to them because they're unbalanced people. Just like, but the same thing with conductors, it's the same thing with CEOs. Uh, anybody whose power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely, only if you haven't done the work on your character only if you're not getting feedback and people who become a master or a sensei, well, they get worshiped as somehow a God or godlike being and people give up their power. And that's the opposite of the real teaching. In my view, hmm. the real teaching is always to help people discover their own natural connection to their life force. And then, empower them to be able to cultivate that and develop it so that they feel better and mm -hmm. they can do more of what they want to do. Well, that's I mean, that's a really important principle that applies to things far beyond, you know, martial arts or, or body practices that, that we, you know, the, the way those the way a lot of stuff is sold to us is that it includes the the spiritual um, guideposts. And nothing does right. There's no there's no practice. There's no movement. There's no system. There's no community that allows you to outsource your own sort of character watchdogness. Like, you know, because we all have all this stuff in us. Right. right? So like what you said about like, if I don't get feedback, if I don't put myself in situations where I'm going to get sometimes brutally necessary feedback, I'm going to develop in twisted ways. Or there have been times, you know, I think of myself as a highly 
ethical person. There have been times where, because of the way a business deal was structured, I found myself acting in in ways that I'm now embarrassed. And so now I realize, okay, you know what? I'm not so great. I'm not so, I'm not so ethical and perfect. Like what I need to do if I if I aspire to that is to really introspect a lot, have people yeah. around me who have explicit permission to talk to me and try to create situations in which I'm not tempted to, to be correct. <laughs> that, correct. That, that, and, but that, but what you just demonstrated is the humility and the curiosity and the recognition that we need help. We need support. We need, we need feedback and that there's no, perfect panacea practice. And so, the, and I'm, these are all the disclaimers because these practices are the coolest thing I have discovered. <laughs> they are really cool and they're so simple and so elegant. And it's one of my absolute favorite things in the world to do is to teach them to people because people really, you know, people really love it. If they do feel better, they do really, but the, but the thing is to teach them in a way that they can go off and do it by themselves. Right. So so what was your first uh, exposure to it, and what made you go, oh wow, this is really great? Okay, so so uh, there are a couple. So the first was I, I trained as an Alexander Technique teacher. I didn't realize that that was Tasmanian Qigong until many years later. But I was already familiar with this. If I breathe and move and think in certain ways, I have much more vi vitality. Mm -hmm. And I developed a, a very refined kinesthetic sensitivity because you, you have to in Alexander work. When I trained, you weren't allowed to work on anybody else until you reached a certain standard of poise and balance and ease in your own movement. And And my teachers were super strict about never trying to do anything to anybody without working on yourself first. So that was how I, I was trained. So I was already familiar with with this uh, as a sensation. I mean, I had the experience through the Alexander technique of feeling fully integrated, poised, balanced, and my movement was effortless. So, and I had that experience starting when I was 20. Mm. And that was my benchmark. But then I was I was I was studying Aikido and I was really passionate. I mean, I used to I used to train two or three hours every day and go to every seminar and then take private lessons with some of the great masters, just all in, totally focused. So when I got my my black belt, I went to my sensei. And my sensei was smaller than me. I outweighed him by about probably 40 pounds, was three inches taller. And I, and you know, I was in incredible shape. I was working out all the time, but he could effortlessly throw me across the room and I just couldn't touch him no matter how hard, how hard and fast. So I was faster and physically stronger and I couldn't touch him and I'd wind up across the room. <laughs> So what? So these are very practical things because I, you know, I was really trying to get them and I could not get them. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so when I got my black belt, I went to my sensei, and I said, "Look, sensei, I know all the moves, I know all the names in Japanese, and I can do them in any combination." I said, "But you've got way more effortless power." Like there's some ineffable something that you've got that I don't have yet, and I want that. How do I get it? <laughs> so he said, oh, study Qigong. <laughs> <laughs> so he introduced me to the Qigong teacher that he was working with. And we would just do standing meditation. We would just... And he, this guy, was he never explained it. He never talked about it. We would just stand with our knees slightly bent, posture upright, different hand positions. 
And I think you know, it was cool. And I remember I, I, I thought it would be easy to just stand there, but after five or six minutes, standing with your knees bent, arms start to shake, shoulder starts to hurt, hip gets tight. So what I realized is, oh, anything that I'm doing that's unnecessary tension will be exposed by just standing here. Mm. And it's going to start to hurt until I can release it. So it was a new way of training my kinesthetic awareness to go deeper even than I had as an Alexander trainee. And then I was also very impressed because the, the master would come around and when I was really struggling, he would just touch me very lightly. And all of a sudden I would ease up and I could stand much longer. And I thought this is just like a master Alexander technique teacher. He's pretty much doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I could, I, and I also would, would notice that after I did standing meditation, I did seem to have, there was more juice in my Aikido. So the next, the next big aha was I found out that this, uh, another Qigong master was coming to town. This is when I lived in Washington, DC. And one could just go and get private sessions with him for what seemed like a, a pretty reasonable amount of money. It turned out it was very reasonable because privately in Chicago, where he was based, his sessions were $400. And he was charging $80 in this clinic in DC. Hmm. And I thought, this is too good to be true. And even I had nothing really wrong with me. I said, I got to go experience what this guy does. And he was a Western trained MD, as well as a lineage Chinese master. And just one of the, one of the coolest people I've ever met. His name was Dr. Dong, Dean Y. Dong, D-E-N-G. And he had the most wonderful laugh. But the, the most amazing thing was he, he put his hands on or near me. And the feeling was of waves of energy coming from his hands through my body. Waves and waves of energy. And after every treatment I had with him, it just felt like I had a, a vacation. I felt so rested and rejuvenated and whatever soreness or injuries I had just seemed to dissipate. So I thought this is you know, incredibly cool. I just kept going to sessions with him. And I, I prevailed upon him to do a teacher training of one of the methods that he taught and certify us, which he did. So then I started teaching that on seminars and everybody loved it. It's called the Eight, Eight Treasures of Qigong. It's one of the ancient, ancient systems. He wrote a book about it. So, so that, that was the next level of aha. But then the really big... Uh, big shift. So I was practicing this and teaching this for decades already. But then in I guess it was 2008, I started to have trouble with my my hip. And I called in all my energy medicine master friends and acupuncturists and healers. And it was just like Humpty Dumpty, nobody could help me because my hip was falling apart. And I had to get a hip replacement. And I'd also had two previous knee surgeries. And when you get a hip replacement, and you've had a bad knee, they tell you, well, one of two things is going to happen. Your knee is either going to get better or worse. <laughs> well, mine got a lot worse and I needed a knee replacement. So the hip replacement was hard, but the knee replacement was really difficult. And do you, I don't know if you ever have you ever have a Charlie horse? Yep. Well, I had one for two weeks in my right calf muscle that didn't stop. <sighs> Just constant cramping pain. And I couldn't put any weight on my right leg at all. I had to get out of bed. I had to get on the walker and hop. And it was it was not fun. So there was one moment I'm on the walker. Balance on my left foot in a lot of pain and 
two things happened. One is I just, I lengthened up. You know, I'd learned many years ago from my Alexander training how to get that natural lengthening of the spine no matter what's going on. So I lengthened up to my full stature, even on the walker. And I, and I didn't lean on the walker so much. I just used it. And I just thought, I'm going to take everything I have ever learned about the Alexander Technique, Qigong, and other inner practices to recover from this knee thing and get in better shape than I ever have been, but in a different way and really, really learn how to heal myself. So I started, that was my impetus to go and meet and study intensively with Qigong masters. And I did that and I didn't just interview them. I went and took residential seminars, private lessons, with a lot of really cool people. And first of all, by the way, it worked. I, I recovered, I got to the point where I could, I can now, I can do an endless number of squats. Hmm. I can walk for 10 miles. I can do whatever I need to do. Uh, so, I took the best of the practices from the various masters and synthesized them and tried to make them as simple as possible. And I also, I also uh, created at, at Omega Institute, the first super chi summit where I brought a lot of these great masters together and they met each other for the first time at Omega, which was really cool. But then I just kept curating and curating and curating to find who, for me, who are the most wonderful teachers. And my criteria is always not just that you're utterly brilliant at the practice, but that you are a person of the highest character and trustworthiness. So that led me to, to what I, I, so now at Omega, I teach the Super G weekend with Robert Peng and Ken Cohen, who are at the highest level of skill and integrity. So that's, that's, uh, and, and I've been, obviously I've been synthesized this all and I teach it myself. I teach it to my corporate clients. I teach it to my coaching clients. And my parent, I, you know, my dad is 95. He's lived through unbelievable physical issues and told he was going to be dead more than once. I go see him in New Jersey and I teach him a little bit of Qigong and he does it. And he says to me, you know, my balance is a little bit better. Hmm. That feels really good. <laughs> it's pretty cool. Okay. So, so we're 33 minutes in and, um, I, you know, you've like really explained how it helps, where it kind of comes from, how you've integrated it. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> I, I bet I bet people are hungry now. Like, okay, give me some of this. Yeah. <laughs> well, there 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 are seven thousand different lineages <laughs> we know of, that scholars know of now that we can trace, and and but of those, there are there's seven or eight practices that almost all the lineages have in common. All the ones that have been studied that there, there are some practices that go across all this so that you would recognize them. And what they all involve, what they all involve is some simple movements, breathing patterns, and ways of thinking, intention, a mindset, a visualization. But the best of the best of the methodologies, if you just do the movement and the breathing, it, it shifts your consciousness just by itself. Hmm. So 
The simple, the simple, you want me to teach you one? Sure. It was the basis of everything else. So it's worth, it's worth learning this. And this is something I teach with a lot of focus and a lot of care because partly it's because of my Alexander technique background, but partly it's because everybody wants to get in there and do something. They want to learn some cool new system. You know, it's great to learn uh, the eight treasures. They're beautiful movements. It's great to learn the Yi Jin Jin, uh, which is the original practice that Bodhidharma taught to the monks so that they could become more warrior, warrior monks and started Kung Fu. It's, it's great to learn all these wonderful methodologies, but every single one of them begins with a basic standing posture. And if you get a good basic standing posture, all the rest of your practice will be so much more fruitful. Conversely, if you don't have such a good basic standing posture, you're going to be, you know, it's the crooked man walks a crooked mile. You'll be walking a crooked Qigong practice. The, the amazing thing is, even when people don't have a wonderful standing posture, they still get the benefit. It's amazing. And that's how well, potent yeah. these things well, are. I was going to ask you that because I'm on week three of the program you recommended to me, Robert Peng's Yi Jing Jing. And so we start out, you know, with a st they spend a fair amount of time in a standing posture. And I, right. I'm standing and I'm doing everything, you know, as right as I can. And I'm like, oh, I feel my right lower back. So I'm like, well, good. that's good, right? Like, <laughs> it's that's, telling that's you. That's the point. That's the point. So what you have to worry about is if you don't feel the tensions, if you do, because that's how people hurt themselves doing yoga uh, or Tai Chi or anything, because they want to, it's what Alexander called end gaining. People want to do the thing, but the teachings of, of the real teaching of Qigong and, and Tai Chi and the Alexander technique, part of why I love them all so much is the way you do the thing is at least as important as the thing that you do. Mm. So it's the way you do it. So, so you know that when you're taking your, your class with Robert Peng, he says, he says, when you raise your hands, he says, you don't raise them mechanically. You don't, you let your breath float your hands up, for example. It's a whole different feeling. Now, this is part of why it helps to have a teacher because you can think you're doing what he says, but you ain't. Yeah. And the teacher can give you feedback. And, and that's why that's part of why I love this is that no matter how many years you've been doing this, you can always learn something new. There's always less you can be doing uh -huh. to get more of a result. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, okay, that, so that, I mean, that's, that's how I teach coaching too. like, you know, like, like if you're working, you're working too hard. It's, see, this is a universal truth. It applies to, to many, many things. It's having the right amount of energy in the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. That's another description of, of, of poise. So, so we want to have a poised standing posture. So just, just for basic starters, you're standing, your feet are flat on the floor, your knees are slightly bent, or as I love the way Robert Pink says, unlock it. Yeah. <laughs> unlock it. <laughs> so don't lock your knees. And the way I teach is I always say, you always start with a smile. So the little smile, because the thing you see, you're taking Robert's class, he's always smiling. Mm -hmm. Ken Cohen is always smiling. The Buddha is always smiling. So that it's one of the ways of recognizing someone who has a positive connection with the teaching is they're going to be happy. They're going to be yeah. having fun. Yeah, I remember reading I mean, that I, in the Tao of Pooh about like the, 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 the sweetness as opposed to some other traditions, you know, Confucianism or the sort of more 
suffering based or sorrow based or rule based. Yeah. <laughs> Why would you do that when you could do this? Yeah. Right? So, <laughs> so we begin with a smile. Now, this is this is a simple little thing we're going to do. Just say out loud the phrase let go. Okay. Let go. Let go. Do you notice where your tongue goes when you say the la in let go? Yeah, just uh, t roof of the mouth, just in, just above the teeth. Correct. Just behind the upper teeth. So that point happens to be an acupuncture point. And when you gently, gently press it with the tip of your tongue, it helps to integrate the flow of energy down the front of your body and up the back. So start with a little smile and then put your tongue on that point, just lightly, gently, consciously. Then you want to be, of course, aligned around the vertical axis. So one way of thinking about that is as though there's a, a fine thread that goes up to heaven and it goes through the top of your head, down through the center of your body, through your perineum, and into the center of the earth. So you want to do everything you do aligned around the central axis. Okay, so we've got smile, tongue on the point, aligned around the central axis. Mm -hmm. And then you want this to be as natural as it can be. So I like to practice when the weather allows right out in front of the willow trees that are outside in my land where I live here. Sometimes I practice inside, look if it's too cold, looking at the trees through the window. But I like to be natural like a willow tree. So just think of your stance being as natural, just like the willow tree is completely natural standing. That's how you are. Okay. Like you belong here. Mm. You don't have to prove yourself. That's that's already a lifetime's worth of unpacking right there. That right? just that that thought, oh look, that tree doesn't is fine, right? Like it's it's itself. But me, boy, do I have work to do. <laughs> right? Well not not when we're doing this practice. Right? And then distribute your weight evenly, not just between the two feet, but you'll notice that you can distribute the weight between the balls of your feet and the heels and the inside edge and the outside edge of each foot. Okay. So I want the weight distributed evenly. Now that's not a static condition because it's always slightly shifting and changing. Mm -hmm. But generally speaking, I don't want to be tipping over or leaning on one side or the other. I want my weight distributed evenly. Right. So I want you to notice smile S tongue on the point T alignment a natural N distribute D that's an acronym stand. Mm. Okay, stand. Now I'm going to give you the next part. Exhale. Exhale. Nose or mouth doesn't matter. Whatever you whatever you like. Awaken your awareness. So become aware of being aware. Soften everything you can soften your forehead, your eyes, your jaw, your shoulders, lower back, thighs, ankles. And then expand and enjoy open expand into the energy that is liberated by your standing. So what we just learned is exhale, that's E. Awaken awareness, that's A. Soften, that's S. And expand, enjoy, that's E. So the acronym ease is stand ease. You make these up? I did. Damn good. Thank you.
Right? And, and so when you stand, and so, so here's the practice. The practice is don't just do something, stand there. Hmm. Right? So practice by standing. And if you want to get more of a workout, if you want to get even more chi flowing, you can, it's like you're, it's always like you're sitting on a tall stool. You can just lower the stool a little bit. So you, mm-hmm. you feel you engage your lower body more. Right now, if you go all the way down, if I go all the way down to a horse stance, it's very hard. That's unsustainable for most people unless you're doing serious, intensive kung fu training. And it's it's not necessary. So somewhere between a really, really deep stance and just standing fully upright. and, And you can do this right now. Just experiment with where when you sit, soften your hips and sit on that tall stool. Where do you get a level of engagement that feels like, hey, I might be able to stand here for, you know, for starters, just do two or three minutes of standing meditation. Mm. And to, you know, try to do two or three minutes. Uh, and then when that becomes easy, go for five minutes. And then work your way up to 20 minutes. Because 20 minutes seems to be the optimal practice time for getting the maximum benefit in the shortest amount of time. Mm. I've, you know, I've done sessions where we, we did standing meditation for an hour and it's cool. You know, and when I was training like a maniac, I wanted to find out you know, how much I could do. So it's, mm-hmm. it was cool to do it, but I stand for 20 minutes, maybe 25 or 30 minutes. If I'm really in the groove, you know, there's a pond near my house and a path that leads there, and no one's ever there. And the other day, there was a blue heron on the pond, Mm -hmm. and he was in a perfect standing posture. And I just said, I'm going to do my standing meditation until the blue heron moves. (laughs) It it turned out to be about 18 minutes. But I was just, boom, right there with the blue heron, letting him teach me, Hmm. just like I let the willow tree teach me. And, you know, in the beginning, the reason I say do two or three minutes is you will find, if you try to do this too long, you will start shaking. You will, you'll be amazed at how difficult it is, especially if you have a deeper stance. However, if you find the optimum depth of stance and practice time, what you'll find is, well, I won't tell you what you find. I'll tell you what I find and what my students usually find is you have way more energy than you did when you started standing Mm. by just standing there. Uh And now just one other little tip is if you, as you start to stand longer, don't just finish and immediately start to walk away. You want to ease yourself. This is where the, so the shifting you've seen me do when we've been on previous Mm -hmm virtual meetings, you want to just shift your weight a little bit before you walk away. Right? And when you shift your weight, I want you to notice that the column of my spine doesn't shift, doesn't change. So I'm not swaying. I'm not doing this. Mm-hmm. Right? This stays the same. You know, so, the, so the hips are essentially yeah. a, a bowl that's trying not to tip. Uh, if you if the if the pelvic basin was fill, filled, nothing would be tipping. Right. So you're just bending bending one knee and then the other, and keeping the torso, the pelvis, and the torso uh, upright. Yes, and smiling. Mm, smiling. Forgot to smile. <laughs> and and I guess the practice then, during this twenty minutes is continually go back through stand ease. Correcto. That's why I made that up. That's what I do myself. Uh, I just go, okay, did I? Because you'll lose your smile because you think, oh my God, this is getting hard. Mm. Or you, you, you know, you keep the idea is not to keep your tongue there mechanically, it's to have it there like you're really giving yourself an acupuncture treatment. 
And then how refined can my alignment around the central axis be? And of course, I can I just let myself be even more natural like my willow tree. And then check the distribution of my weight. Exhale with a big smile. Awaken awareness. Be aware of being aware. So the S stands for soft and ease, but also there's a Chinese word, song, which means relax, release, let go, let everything be as, in its most natural, easy state. Mm. And then expand and enjoy. Okay. So that is stand, ease. And yes, that's exact. So that's how you practice standing meditation is just keep reviewing stand, ease. And then if you like, you can connect with a heron or a mm. willow tree or the sky. Yeah. And then there you do practice. So then there are hand postures that evoke different energies and different flows and different intentions. And then you learn those and then you start to develop different forms and practices. But if you have a strong balanced basic stance you'll get so much more out of all of those mm. so it's really worth cultivating standing meditation okay a couple, couple of refinement questions so you sure. talked about the heron or the willow tree do you recommend eyes open always or eyes closed sometimes or when you're starting in in the beginning i'd recommend eyes open and soft uh, because we want to keep you uh, present to what's really happening in, in, in the now mm. and uh, not provide a, just a, 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 a platform for you to space out from. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. In the beginning, now later on, you can close your eyes and some people find it helps them get more accurate kinesthetic feedback when they go inside in that way. In the beginning, uh, eyes open, but soft. Okay. Um, and when you when you're just starting hands can just arms can just dangle. Hands are just at your side, right? Uh, uh, there, again, there are innumerable hand postures. Uh, generally speaking, like some people will have you know, you'll see some people doing standing meditation, and they seem to be puffed out like this. But don't do that as a doing that happens when the chi starts to flow and you get this expansion in your armpits because you're not people people are compressed they're at their desk that like this and they and they start standing and then after a while their shoulders drop because it's hard to hold them up because you're just standing there and then you get this buoyancy and then and then you look like that the real way but a lot of people try to imitate. I'm now doing Qigong and mm. they're just imposing more tension on a imbalanced system. So mm. I'm aiming to ease away the unnecessary, not add on more unnecessary on top of the unnecessary we're already carrying around. Gotcha. What, what about breath patterns? What, what do you recommend for Keep beginning? Breathing all the time. Keep breathing. Don't stop. Keep breathing. Any particular, you know, inhale, nose, out, mouth, uh, chest, belly. For all these practices, inhale uh, through your nose. The exhale is optional through your mouth or your nose. Okay. And other than that, at the beginning, uh, just natural breathing. Uh, as you already know from the beginning of the Yijin Jing, there are, there's reverse breathing, belly breathing, moderate fire breathing, strong fire breathing, and all sorts of other things. But it's amazing the benefits you get just from natural, regular breathing in through your nose. Yeah, uh, I would uh, belly breathing versus chest breathing. But mm. that'll happen naturally. Okay, that'll happen. naturally. Okay. And you recommend, you know, doing it every day, like if you're just starting out and all you can do is two minutes, do you want to do 20 minutes, like do it 10 times or like what? No, 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 just do two or three minutes once a day. Okay. And work your way up to five minutes once a day. 
and then seven minutes. And the thing, this is different than I'm going to do 50 reps with 27 pounds and uh, with on one hand, uh, watch me. It's not that. <laughs> I, I feel very called out. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, okay, three minutes, 52 <laughs> seconds. I got a minute and eight seconds to go, and I'm going to fucking stay here yeah. until I'm done. I'm I'm G. I'm doing the G. I am the king of G. Uh, uh, yeah, so let's. Uh, Alexander had this great word. He said, uh, uh, inhibit, inhibit those tendencies. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, and I promise you that's not the only place in my life they show up. Yeah, well, that's a lot of us. So, but it's, it's just, you know, it's much easier to get people who overwork and overachieve mm -hmm. to calm down and, and relax mm -hmm. than it is to get people who are lazy and don't show up to do anything. <laughs> right. so, <laughs> Good point. So, so what's my signal that I've done enough? Because, like, you know, I could go, okay, today I'm going to do seven minutes. And maybe I shouldn't do seven minutes. Maybe minutes four through seven are actually problematic. Like, yeah. how, how, what, how do I develop yeah. the, the yeah. discernment? You don't want to do anything that feels like it's hurting you or, or potentially injuring you. Okay. That just, you know, so what I always tell uh, my students in every seminar I teach of all kinds, but especially with these practices, is the, the new age cliche that you are your own guru, you are your own sensei, you are mm. your own master, is really so. Mm. You are you must take responsibility. You must tune in. Yeah, it's great if you have a teacher there and you can ask and you can get some feedback on what you're doing and you can feel better and get us. But you must discern. You must discern. So basic criteria for discernment are if, you know, if you started to feel dizzy, for example, mm. sit down, to, uh, have a glass of water. Uh, uh, if something's shaking tremendously and you feel really uncomfortable, stop. So common sense. Uh, and, and one of the things to discern in these kinds of practices is what is what is the stress that is optimal, that is helping me get stronger internally mm. versus what is the stress that is just more stress that I don't need? Mm. And only you can answer that question, but I can tell you to ask yourself that question. Mm. That's... That's so important, you know, because I think we, we a lot of people who are into self improvement have bought into a kind of a, um, a version of stoicism that says, like, the more suffering, the better. Right. Like, you know, we constantly hear you only grow when you're out of your comfort zone. Well, a, a previous podcast guest, Jack Allen Weber, was writing on Facebook, he says, actually, you know, th that can be dangerous. What you, the way you grow is by having support to do things you couldn't do otherwise. It's it's much much well, more I about kindness and and support than making yourself miserable to grow. Well, I, I would also here's another way to think about that too. Uh, I agree with everything that Jack said and that you just said, and I would add uh, part of how you grow is if this is your comfort zone experiment with going 10 to 15 percent beyond it not 40 or 90 percent beyond it or 300 percent beyond it mm -hmm. so here's my comfort zone let me experiment let me see if i you know so i've been standing for 12 minutes let me uh 10 to 15 percent more might be Standing for 14 minutes or 15 minutes. Let me let me see what how that works. And then I try that for a few days. Mm -hmm. And then I say, okay, let's go to another 10. Because then all of a sudden now my new comfort zone is 15 minutes. And mm -hmm. that's what that's what happened. That's what growth is, is 
you know, when I first was, was doing regular standing meditation, really, when I first went to Master Ma's class and did standing meditation, 20 minutes was, was tough. And then it became my baseline. Mm. So then I don't do, I also, you know, I have a lot of other things to do in, in, in the day. So if I want more of a workout, I don't have to do more time. I can just sit a little deeper into my stance. Uh huh. Okay. You see, so I could go, let me do 5% deeper stance. But then what's great is if it's becoming too much, I can just ease off. So I don't have to stop. I can just come up a little bit. Uh huh. And then I can sink back down into it. So that I'm, I'm exploring and finding how do I in a within with a truly holistic approach, expand my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Got it. So so there's something between the comfort zone and the sort of pain, tough it out zone where where growth can happen. Right. That's right. that's and the, that's what I think and the exactly. support we can bring to it ourselves is that discernment. Yes, and the sense of humor. Mm. Because, you know, I swear, it just drives me crazy. You go to a yoga class, a Tai Chi class, whatever, and people, they look so serious and miserable. <laughs> I mean, that, it tells me that there's not mastery there. Mm. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah, when I, I went to Omega once, and uh, I almost ran over Rodney Yee. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was trying to I was trying to find the right building and I was I didn't look where I was going and he sort of scurried out of the way. He, he seemed perfectly ha fine, happy. Well, I think, you know, he's so flexible. You, if you run him over, he'd just probably find a way to yeah. go with it and he'd be fine. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I should have I, I wanted to see what would happen, honestly. <laughs> so speaking of, of, of Omega and your can you um, Give us for people who want to find out more about you or read the book that you wrote about Chi Energy or the, the workshops that you offer in the summits. Where, where do people sure. follow up? The best thing to do is for people just to come to uh, my website, michaelgeld.com. That's G E L B, michaelgeld.com, and sign up for our free newsletter because then we'll let you know we offer some video programs. We do live online trainings. Uh, I'll be teaching in Malibu at an Alexander Technique retreat around Christmas time. But I, I teach. Is that for for practitioners or for lay people? For all, it's open to everybody, total beginners and mm -hmm. teachers all come on it. And I teach uh, I teach my synthesis of Body learning, Qigong, Tai Chi. Good. I did. Uh, I did a year of I, Alexander well, Technique, you know, with Robin Simmons. And I, it was 1988, 89. I can't remember a thing. <laughs> the, uh, well, uh, having said that, you're 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 a pretty poised guy. I mean, you, you know, you're you're a lot better shape than a lot of other people I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> so, maybe I remember. So I, I remember. I remember lying on books. <laughs> well, there you go. So hopefully, hopefully, one of the books you were lying on was one of mine. <laughs> And it, the osmosis made it go into your so well. Body, you uh, know, anyway, Michael, you know, you know, body learning is the book that turned me on to the whole the whole deal. Cool. Well, that's the book mm -hmm. I recommend people start with, uh, uh, because body learning gives you a Western perspective on all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But the best thing to do is come, come to a class, preferably live, and we'll let you know when we're doing those, and. Uh, I could also obviously recommend the other teachers that I recommend both online and live. All right. Well, right to me. So. Well, Michael, thank, thank you for being flexible and just uh, ju jumping on the, the call with me. I, I was, you know, I've been practicing. I got excited about it. And I'm like, when I'm excited, yeah. I, I want to, you know, I don't want to schedule something three weeks in the future. I want to <laughs> share it right away. So I really appreciate your, your spirit and your generosity and your sense of humor. Well, thank you. And wait, the thing about, about Chi is, I say to people, imagine that you had this resource. 
It was unlimited. It could enrich your life on so many levels. And it was free. Mm. And it was simple and easy to access. And once you learn the basics, it's literally free. I mean, if you just did standing meditation every day for the rest of your life and built up to 20 minutes a day, be absolutely life changing. You don't need another lesson. You don't need to pay anything. Just gave it to you for free. Stand ease. God bless. All right. I, you've inspired me. I, I'm, you know, I'm not sure. I, I think I, I'm going to add like two minutes of the standing to the stuff I'm doing with Robert and then see, see how it goes from there. I'm also, I'm also just before we go, I'm curious whether you can take sort of um, snacks qigong snacks throughout the day so you've got your whatever your two minutes to five minutes to 20 minutes is your practice but like if i'm running late to a meeting or i have to sit down and i have to write something and i'm not feeling inspired or creative are there ways to like draw upon it in the moment well in my cup here is some Chinese tea, which I ordered from Ken Cohen. Okay. And it's, it's, it's really funny. Uh, uh, it just arrived today. So I, I made, made a pot right away. And it's, it's an exceedingly rare and exquisite Chinese tea. And one thing I noticed, so my, one, all of the Qigong masters that I've become friends with and teach with, they're all passionately in love with Chinese tea. Huh. And, and they all serve it either before, during, or after their classes. So like I'm, uh, at, we're finishing this thing. The next thing I'm going to do is my uh, Yi Jin Jing practice mm -hmm. today. Okay. And I might take a break in the middle of it and have some of this exquisite tea. I told, I told my wife, I said, honey, I'm meditating on this tea. She said, based on how much you paid for it, you better meditate on it. <laughs> <laughs> you got to get every, got to get your money's worth. <laughs> oh. All right. Well, now, now we got to tell people where they go find that. <laughs> uh, uh, that that's uh, Ken Cohen. If you just, if you look up Ken Cohen. Okay. I think his, his, his website might be something like Qigong Healing. Uh, I'll, I'll put it in the show notes. Put them in, so the, the people I recommend, Ken Cohn, Robert Pang, the other great master that I used to teach with and, and uh, study with a lot, uh, unfortunately passed away. But we used to share tea. Uh, he was also my Tai Chi teacher. And he wrote a phenomenal book called The Internal Structure of Cloud Hands. Uh, it, it's an advanced Tai Chi book, but it's, it is, if you want to stretch your mind mm. with what's really going on in, in Tai Chi and Qigong practices, read the internal structure of Cloud Hands. I wrote the foreword to it, and the foreword tells more of the story of how I was introduced to my the martial side of Tai Chi practice. All right. All right. That'll go in the show notes as well. Michael, thank you cool. so much. I feel like I feel like I have learned something like this podcast is a is a giant front for me learning stuff, <laughs> meeting great cool. people and then sucking their knowledge out of them. And <laughs> so, uh, well, the more we give it away, the more we benefit. So, amen. Amen. So amen. thank you so right, much. Brother. Have a great weekend. I'll talk to you again soon. Ciao. Bye. Bye.